Well, thank you all so much for coming. My name is Roger Roots. I'm, uh, I'm with Lysander Spooner University and uh, also an advisor to the Fully Informed Jury Association. And uh, our topic today is juries and jury nullification in law and practice. And we have a great panel today. Uh, David Lane, who is on the program, could not make it. Um, and he was going to talk about the Colorado method of jury selection in a capital case. Uh, he recently notified me he could not make it today. But we do have myself and two distinguished panelists. First to my left is Mr. Paul Grant, a very prominent attorney uh, in this area who's had a lot of experience uh, with jury and jury nullification questions in his practice. Uh, we also have Kirsten Tynan, the national director of the Fully Informed Jury Association, also known as FIJA. And she lives like I live in Montana. I live in Livingston, Montana. She lives in Phillipsburg, Montana. Uh, again, the uh, Fully Informed Jury Association is the oldest and largest organization solely dedicated to informing jurors and educating jurors and potential jurors about their rights and their duties and their constitutional role as a, as a check on government. Anyway, I also am doing a paper. My paper, I think it's listed in the program as the government crackdown on fully informed juries. Um, and the Denver chapter is what I'm talking about. Uh, many of you may know that Denver is sort of ground, ground zero at the moment for some litigation that is happening nationwide. It's probably one of the most prominent locations for some actually civil lawsuits and some criminal cases that are happening right now and began in 2014. First, I always like to start with this quote from Thomas Jefferson. I consider trial by jury as the only anchor yet devised by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. And that is a very famous quote by Thomas Jefferson. It's been repeated many times. It's been repeated in U.S. Supreme Court opinions. Uh, the thing is, it's almost been rendered not true because today's practice almost bars jurors from keeping government to the principles of its constitution. Because in modern practice, at least in most jurisdictions and in most criminal courtrooms, the judges falsely instruct the juries that they are not to consider the Constitution. They're not to read the Constitution. Many people are surprised at this fact. But in modern practice, many judges believe that they tell the juries what the Constitution means, if anything. The juries are not to look at it independently. In fact, I believe I've never seen a case solely like this, uh, you know, to totally on point. But I believe, many judges believe, that jurors are not even supposed to read the Constitution while they are deliberating because they believe that they are the source of the law. They tell the juries what the law is. The juries are supposedly uh, consigned to a lowly level of just being fact finders in modern practice. Um, government hates trial by jury. The government hates trial by jury. Uh, and why is that? Because, let's say, a tyrant did. If, if you want tyrannical government, a government that controls and sort of monitors and manipulates every aspect of human life, trial by jury is a fundamental problem. You can't create a total tyranny as long as there is trial by jury. And so you see these must convict jury instructions, which are quite common in federal court, especially, and you see it in a lot of states as well, where at the end of a criminal trial, the judge will falsely tell the jury that if you find that the government proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty. And it's simply not true. It's a lie. This, these are false statements that are instructed by judges to juries all over the country virtually every week. If you find that the government proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty. And it's simply not true. By constitutional design, of course, going back hundreds of years, juries have always had the right and the power to act as a check on government and to <laughs> declare anyone not guilty for any reason and to absolutely defy the state. 
uh, government also uses denial of the right to reference the law, including the Constitution. If a defense lawyer, for example, in a firearm prosecution or a drug prosecution, let's take a firearm prosecution, if a defense lawyer in his closing argument wraps up and says, you know, there is a Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, the prosecutor will object, the judge will sustain the objection. So the judges will <clears throat> almost try to get the jurors not to know about any, any provision of the Constitution or any legal uh, aspect of the law. They don't want juries to even look into the law. They tell the juries what the law means. Oath warnings are quite typical. <clears throat> Most juries, when they are sworn at the beginning, take an oath. They take an oath, and sometimes those oaths, depend, depending on the jurisdiction, <clears throat> are very confusing. They're badly written. Some of them go back to the 1800s. I hereby swear to give a true verdict blah, 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 according to blah, 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 as I'm instructed to do so, you know. Uh, and then it happens frequently if a trial goes a few days or even a week. The judge at, at the end of the trial will lecture the jury. You will be violating your oath as a juror if you dare to consider, you know, to, to uh, disagree with me about what the law is. I tell you what the law is. Just think about the arrogance of it. There is discretion in all aspects of criminal justice. Police have discretion. They can choose not to arrest. Uh, prosecutors have discretion. They can choose not to prosecute. But government feels that it, it can tell the common people that they have no discretion. They must convict. Uh, and of course, jurors are kept in the dark regarding sentencing, which is almost the opposite of, of the way that it was a century ago when in many jurisdictions, juries actually sentenced uh, the defendants. Today, they are kept in the dark. They are actually, um, you'll be, if you're a defense lawyer and you, and you mention possible sentence, there can be an objection by the prosecution and the judge will sustain the objection. The jury is not to be told potential sentences. They're just to say not guilty or guilty. And if guilty, you know, then the judge, then the, the sentencing proceedings commence. And of course, frequently there today, there is the problem of sentencing for acquitted conduct, which has become a big problem because there's so many indictments now that are multi, uh, you know, multi-count indictments. And so it happens occasionally that a jury will feel that they are slapping the defendant on the wrist. They'll say, well, we'll, we'll declare not guilty of almost everything, but we'll find him guilty of what we think is a minor count. It happened in the Branch Davidian case in Waco in, what, 1993 or four. or so. The jury thought they were slapping the guys on the wrist and they'd get a year or two years in jail. Then that commenced the sentencing proceedings. The judge then, according to the sentencing guidelines that existed at that time, gets to rope in acquitted conduct, saying, well, now I get to evaluate the defendant as a whole. And by the way, oh, he actually sort of did do all the stuff that the jury said he didn't do. And so we will sentence him in accordance. I apologize. <laughs> in accordance, as if he had been, as if he had been convicted of the counts that the jury acquitted him of. And so you see that kind of problem. Anyway, uh, by the way, in a, in a great case recently, that uh, Justice Scalia wrote a great opinion a couple of years before his death, his recent death. Uh, What's the name of the case where they, they rendered the U.S. sentencing guidelines to be merely uh, advisory? What's the name of that opinion? Blakely or not Blakely, but one of those. Anyways, uh, it's a problem that the courts are increasingly recognizing, that the judges are, are sometimes at sentencing will rope in acquitted conduct and then sentence the <clears throat> defendant as if he had been convicted, thus nullifying the jury. And, of course, what we're talking about today, jury nullification. Another major weapon in the government's arsenal is the suppression of jury information outside the courthouse. And to me, this is the most insidious uh, tool that, that prosecutors are increasingly using, which is that pamphleteers outside the courthouse who will do nothing more than pass out literature, such as FIJA literature, Fully Informed Jury Association literature. Uh, FIJA has activists occasionally around the country who will 
go to courthouse parking lots and things and stand around outside courthouses and hand out literature. True or false? Did you know that as a jury you have the right to declare anyone not guilty at any time, even if the government proves its case? Do you know that you have the right to vote your conscience? Keep in mind, inside the court, courthouse, the judges will falsely tell the juries that they don't have the right to vote their conscience. And so prosecutors hate the transmission of this information, even on the streets, even on websites, even on, uh, you know, in public forums. I, I get the sense almost that prosecutors would love to ban this, this thought, the thought that juries have the right to act as a check on government. Which brings us to the city of Denver, where we are. Uh, beginning in 2014, there has been a series of arrests here in Denver um, for jury tampering. In other words, just the mere act, there have been a, a couple of, of guys who have just, for the mere act of passing out literature, saying that the historic role of the jury is to act as a check on government, will be arrested for jury tampering. And uh, as I said, Denver has become sort of ground zero. Uh, FIJA is actively litigating a major, uh, is it a class action lawsuit? It's an injunction. And it, uh, Just a federal civil rights suit. Federal civil rights suit um, to prevent any further arrests uh, on this. And it's currently being litigated in the federal court right here in the U.S. District of Colorado. Um, here you see some activists who are, you know, out front. Sometimes they are left wing, left right wing. They come from all all backgrounds. Uh, sometimes they are with Occupy Wall Street and movements such as that. And sometimes they are, you know, tax protesters, Tea Party uh, types. Fiji activists come from all all places in the political spectrum. Um, this, of course, has been major news in the last two years. They've been arresting uh, leafleteers here in Denver for the crime of jury tampering. Now, of course, jury tampering is an ancient crime. Jury tampering is the crime of trying to influence a jury in a specific way, in a specific case, where you, you call up a juror, you go to a juror, you threaten, you intimidate, you try to coerce the juror into voting a particular way. It's an ancient crime, and of course, it's a crime that goes way back, and of course, who has a problem with that being a crime? The problem is that, you know, it, it sort of intersects with the First Amendment when they're trying to arrest people for jury tampering when all they're doing is passing out literature informing jurors and potential jurors of their rights. Uh, here are two defendants, the, the main two uh, in Denver, Eric Brandt and Mark Inacelli, who were arrested in July and August 2014 for jury tampering, just for handing out literature right here in Denver at the, uh, the local city courthouse, which I believe, I was told, is only five or six blocks away from where we are right now. Uh, Eric Brandt, of course, is sort of a colorful character here in the Denver area. Uh, he's sort of an Occupy Wall Street kind of an activist. And you can see him holding up a sign that says, uh, can we say this on YouTube, F-U-C-K cops. And he's wearing a shirt that says F-U-C-K cops. Uh, and I, uh, here's the, the picture I love, the, the cop chasing after him, <laughs> running after him. Great shot. Uh, the guy might have a flair for, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the theatrical. And, of course, then you see him being that way in handcuffs. Uh, he is one of Fiji's, uh, you know, uh, an activist, and he's been arrested. The charges have been dismissed, and now I believe the prosecution is moving to on appeal to keep the charges going for jury tampering. Uh, Denver is not the only place where this is happening. In Michigan, there is another activist who is handing out this very brochure right here in front of a courthouse on a day when there wasn't even a jury trial going on inside the courthouse, just literally handing out these flyers in public. He's been arrested initially for felony jury tampering. And I believe the, the judge initially posted a $150,000 bail, which he had to, pay to, had to pay to get out. My understanding is recently the, uh, the court has reduced, or maybe even the prosecution has reduced the, the charge from felony obstruction of justice to a, 
high-level misdemeanor jury tampering charge. But anyway, Keith Wood, he's currently being prosecuted in Michigan just for handing out literature in front of the courthouse in Macosta County. So this stuff is actively going on. And as a criminal justice scholar, you know, I find this to be a topic that is understudied. Not, there isn't enough people looking into this, doing research on it. Um, these quotes at the top, you probably can't read. Um, quote, the government is seeking to silence speech it does not like. That's David Coleman, who's the defense attorney for Keith Wood, the man arrested for jury tampering. You compare that to the prosecution's quote. Basically, the defense is saying a jury's a juror's oath does not mean anything. What a wonderful world. That's the Macosta County, Michigan prosecutor. And of course, they constantly invoke this idea that there will be chaos if jurors are allowed to know that they have the right to, to nullify by jury nullification. Just chaos. Again, there is discretion everywhere in the criminal justice system. But jurors, the common people, are told they have no discretion. Uh, one thing that I that I find almost troubling it, as, as just as a legal scholar, there is very little case law at the upper levels because most of the, these cases get resolved at the lowest levels. They get dismissed. And so, in fact, I, I will predict that these cases that we're discussing will probably be dismissed. They'll probably be won by our side, the, the fully informed jury side. And so... You know, you can only get case law at the appellate level that's written and published when you lose at the lower level. And this is a problem. And so uh, if you go to the FIJA website, which is FIJA.org, F-I-J-A.org, uh, there's this little uh, little page about, about some of these cases. And again, these, these cases are almost always resolved at the lowest level, which means that there is not a lot of high-level case law that has developed. Um, I'll just go through another, a, a couple other sort of big players in this game. Julian Heichlin, who is a, a retired chemistry professor from uh, University of Pennsylvania, I believe. Julian Heichlin was arrested at, at the federal courthouse in the U.S. Southern District of New York for jury tampering, for handing out jury literature. He was also arrested in... Uh, uh, Orange County, Florida, for handing out literature. He is sort of travels around the country it's in, in his retirement, uh, handing out literature about uh, jury rights. And he's been arrested many times. And of course, Julian is an old civil rights activist from the 60s. And he has uh, these great, <laughs> you know, he falls, when, when the police approach him, he falls to the ground and sort of, you know, and then they have to come and arrest him. And he's been, they've taken him to mental health facilities and everything else. Why are you doing this? And, you know, but case in point about the case law is he won a big victory in the U.S. Southern District of New York in which a federal judge, Judge Kimball Wood, ruled for him in a great First Amendment decision. But it is a U.S. District Court decision, the lowest level, because she ruled, hey, he has a First Amendment right to hand this stuff out. Which means we don't get good case law in the U.S. Second Circuit Court of Appeals above New York. And so, you know, this is a recurring problem where prosecutors are still bringing these cases, <clears throat> prosecuting people for jury tampering, just for handing out literature. Um, and they're getting away with it largely because the law above is not well settled and not clear. Frank Turney, who is one of the original sort of FIJA activists in Alaska, Frank Turney was arrested for jury tampering in, I believe, about 1992 in Alaska for handing out literature, and he was convicted, and his, his conviction was upheld by the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco. But his case is very fact-specific because he was doing more than simply handing out literature in public. He was uh, allegedly going among the actual jurors who had jury badges on. And he was going inside the courthouse and approaching them and talking to them and saying, call this number, Fiji's 1-800 uh, number, to learn more about it. And so it was very fact-specific. But he did get convicted, and it was upheld. Okay, So these cases can turn on the facts. 
so long as a guy is just handing out literature in a broad sense, not in any way trying to alter the verdict or, or, or impact the verdict in a specific case, generally speaking, the First Amendment will protect it. Anyway, uh, all of this leads to my sort of research on this topic. I'm, I'm doing some preliminary research. My, my, I, I'd love to co uh, collaborate with anyone on this. Um, how common are claims of jury tampering associated with just handing out literature? I hypothesize that if you go back in time, you won't find many of these cases. The prosecution bar is almost trying to develop a doctrine. They're trying to develop a First Amendment exception, probably in the last 20 years. It's almost as if FIJA, which started in 1989, has generated this movement among the prosecutors to create a First Amendment exception. And thankfully, that movement has not gotten far off the ground, but they, I believe there is heightened resolve. The prosecution bar is continuing to make these arrests. And so... Uh, I would love to do some more research into the past just to determine, um, you know, how prevalent, who, who, where was the first guy who was ever arrested for jury tampering just for handing uh, this literature out? And I would love to, again, collaborate with anyone. And uh, finally, I'll just say, uh, again, my hypothesis is that this is a, a theory of the prosecution bar that they are trying to develop into a almost a First Amendment exception, like the shouting fire in a crowded theater exception, like the um, defamation exception, like the, to the First Amendment, the um, fighting words exception to the First Amendment. They are trying to develop a First Amendment exception for informing jurors about their rights. And uh, anyway, this, this is an area that has been understudied and it probably, I think, uh, criminal justice scholars could benefit from really doing a lot more research.